Hey there, Archivians. Paul Edward here. So one of the things that I study as a public archaeologist is the cultural brand. And ancient Egypt is probably the most identifiable of those brands with images like the Sphinx, pyramids, hieroglyphs, mummies. Uh, all of those are easily identifiable to most people in the Western world and beyond. Howard Carter, who became world famous for his team's discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922, fueled academic and popular interest in Egypt, and it also cultivated intrigue that we still feel today. So you're probably familiar with things like ancient curses and how dangerous mummies can be to archaeologists. <laughs> lost a lot of good people on that first field season. And the central figure uh, within this image of ancient Egypt is the massively wealthy and powerful god kings, the, the pharaohs. Tutankhamun is the best known of these, and you know, the things that he was buried with firmly embedded themselves into the imagination of millions. It was grand, opulent, and clearly displayed his great power, and one would assume that Tutankhamun was this impressive ruler, but the reality is that he was actually really kind of a sickly child who ruled from the age of around 9 to 19, and that his reign was part of a rather tense period for Egypt. Uh, his major achievement was really to restore the religion that was abolished under the rule of his probably Father Akhenaten. And in the grand scheme of ancient Egypt, he wasn't incredibly important. And we know of him really because of his tomb, which, unlike those of most pharaohs, hadn't actually been heavily looted by the time it entered into the public eye. So we have a very distorted image and understanding of Tutankhamun and of ancient Egypt itself. But there's another widely known pharaoh that I'd actually really like to talk about here. And this pharaoh's also suffered from a massively distorted image. Cleopatra Thea Philopater was born in either 70 or 69 BCE and was the last pharaoh of Egypt before it was annexed into what was becoming the Roman Empire. And now I'm... I'm not really going to talk too much about that history and all. Uh, there's a ton of writing and days worth of film and documentary on the subject of her. And the history is really interesting, don't get me wrong. But I would like to focus on how she's understood and depicted as a person and as a cultural or social figure. So one of the many things that you could do to learn about Cleopatra is to watch a docudrama that came out in May of 2023 on Netflix. It's a four episode docudrama that's part of a series called African Queens and it features the British actress Adele James in the titular role and was produced and narrated in part by Jada Pinkett Smith. It has not been received kindly. Uh, with its trailer on YouTube being uh, bombarded with racially abusive comments, which ultimately forced that comment section to be turned off. There was a change.org petition against the series that gained around 85,000 signatures, and an Egyptian lawyer, Mahmoud al-Samari, uh, upon watching the trailer, filed a lawsuit against Netflix, told the platform and the makers of the series liable for this crime of portraying Cleopatra as black or mixed race and to have the streaming service banned from Egypt. His suit accuses the docudrama of forgery and states that most of what Netflix displays does not conform to Islamic and societal values and principles, especially Egyptian ones. In order to preserve the Egyptian national and cultural identity among Egyptians all over the world, there must be pride in the makings of such work. And I'm a little curious to know 
exactly what Islamic values he sees being infringed on by the casting choice and the trailer itself. Is he more upset that she's portrayed as a strong woman or that she has some melanin? Anyhow, on the Internet Movie Database, this docudrama currently is rated with 1.1 stars from some 79,000 reviews, over 21,000 of those coming from Egypt. On Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 20% rating from critics, with Anita Singh saying that it's too soapy for serious history fans and not enough of a soap for viewers who like juicy historical dramas. And I can understand that critique. While I thought that overall the docudrama was an alright series, yeah, it did kind of leave me wanting to see a little bit more of one or the other, a little bit more, say, of the reenactment. Audience reviews, however, were um, less charitable, with a 3% rating. And while a lot of the reviewers gave reasons similar to Singh's critique, there were still plenty that took things a bit further. Uh, Some made personal attacks against Pinkett Smith herself, and others leaned into wokeness and historical revisionism and how we need to read the book 1984, I guess. And, you know, then there were some that seemed a little bit more directly racist. And that one right there is the worst that I'm, I'm going to show. Netflix's statement on the casting choice was this. Her ethnicity is not the focus of Queen Cleopatra, but we did intentionally decide to depict her of mixed ethnicity to reflect theories about Cleopatra's possible Egyptian ancestry and the multicultural nature of ancient Egypt. And if you do watch the series, one of the very first things that they discuss is the question of her ethnic background and of Egypt, and saying that it isn't exactly clear-cut. Now, Dr. Zahi Hawass, a well-known and, to say the least, controversial Egyptian archaeologist, naturally felt the need to weigh in on the subject of the casting, rather than the content of the docudrama. So he said that this is completely fake. Cleopatra was Greek, meaning that she was blonde, not black, and that the black civilization has no connection to the Egyptian civilization. Okay, historically, we understand that Cleopatra was part of a Macedonian Greek dynasty that came to rule Egypt in 305 BCE, following the death of Alexander the Great and the collapse of his empire. This dynasty was named after its founder, Ptolemy the Savior. The position that Hawass and others have taken about this blonde Greek dynasty that ruled Egypt for nearly 300 years is not only a massive oversimplification, but it's also a little bit confusing to be used by Egyptians today, especially when we start to consider the history of how Egyptians, and Cleopatra in particular, have been conceived of by the world. The academic question of race or ethnicity regarding the ancient Egyptian world has been a topic of debate for several centuries. And I'll do another video about that that covers it a little bit better. Um, But here it's probably important to talk about some ideas of ethnicity about those who ruled ancient Egypt. So the natural scientist Samuel George Morton was a foundational voice in what's called the American School of Ethnology. And they argued that the cosmetic differences found among humans that today we call race was actually evidence of people being different species. And as such, we uh, naturally have different abilities and capacities. It was scientific racism. And in order to navigate the civilization of ancient Egypt with uh, his worldviews and without any evidence, Morton made this claim. Negroes were numerous in Egypt, but their social position 
in ancient times was the same as it is now in the United States, that of servants and slaves. So, yeah, early anthropologists were kind of trash. But, you know, it is a really good thing that we nip that in the bud really early, right? Several decades later, enter one of the most important figures in the modern discipline of archaeology, Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie. His work in Egypt began around 1880, and he quickly established himself at the forefront of Egyptology. Over his long career, he excavated at some of the most important sites in ancient Egypt and in the Levant. His scientific approach to archaeology had a massive impact on how we excavate, record, and do research. He trained generations of Egyptologists, including Howard Carter, and he was the first Edwards professor in Egyptian archaeology and philology at one of my alma maters, the Institute of Archaeology at University College London. He was also a massive f***ing racist. Flinders Petrie was a eugenicist who blamed the woes of the West on communism, unions, and actively believed that the natural superiority of Northern Europeans was being degraded by undesirable ethnic and social groups. He also professionally believed in dynastic race theory, where white Mesopotamians that he called the followers of Horus invaded Egypt and conquered the, quote, inferior, exhausted mulatto and brought dynastic civilization to Egypt. He based this on measuring the skulls of people his teams excavated and what he saw as the sudden arrival of foreign cultural elements. And this theory shaded a lot of research and writing about Egypt in the late 1800s and in the first quarter of the 1900s. That shadow hasn't completely vanished. Dr. Ahmed Darter, the co-founder of the Institute for Decolonizing Theory, noted the curious position that critics like Hawass have taken regarding Cleopatra and her background. The image of a white, blonde Greek woman. Considering that Cleopatra's family line is pretty well known and Macedonian, uh, outside of a possibly ethnically Egyptian grandmother, the Position of Greekness is an easy one to take, but Darter points out that the Greek claim unravels because of its insistence on racial purity. In other words, its claim is not of a cultural heritage that is up for reinvention and reappropriation, but of a pure racial heritage that extends from ancient to modern Greece, uninterrupted by Byzantium, which is appropriated into the narrative of Greekness, nor by the 400 years of Ottoman rule. This narrative is the work of 18th and 19th century Philhellenism and 19th and 20th century nationalism. Shockingly, that AI-generated image of blonde Greek Cleopatra is a fantasy. That fantasy of racial purity of the Greeks themselves or of the Egyptian rulership isn't too far removed from the racist claims that people like Flinders Petrie made of Egypt. Fundamentally, we have to recognize that the story of Egypt is one that Egyptians have not had much control over, which is certainly part of the frustration voiced with choices in casting Cleopatras. The role has typically gone to white, non-Egyptian actresses like Vivian Lee or Elizabeth Taylor and more recently, Gal Gadot has been controversially tapped to play her in an upcoming movie by Universal Studios. And these have been accused of whitewashing the past and the character herself. And yet nobody is actually filing a lawsuit against Universal or trying to ban the movie or the studio from Egypt. People... Godot included, took the Greek angle of this argument to defend the casting choice, and a writer for Screen Rant took it a bit further to say that many people feel it's the latest example of the film industry's whitewashing problem, and that a Middle Eastern actress would be a more suitable choice for the role of the Egyptian queen. 
Historically, however, Cleopatra was a Greek woman of white Macedonian ancestry, as were all the Ptolemy rulers, whose reign preceded the Arab invasions of Egypt. Furthermore, Gal Gadot is an Israeli actress of Ashkenazi ancestry, making the claims of whitewashing a harmful example of misunderstanding and erasing her Jewish identity. So, it's inappropriate for Arabs to play Cleopatra, and it's anti-Semitic to say that maybe Gal Gadot shouldn't be in the role. Our understanding and knowledge of Cleopatra's story isn't even a particularly Egyptian one. Her history largely exists in the Western world because of its attachment to the rise of the Roman Empire and the downfall of two Roman figures, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Much of her story is filtered through later historians and authors, and their views weren't exactly neutral. There are roughly 50 Roman works that talk about Cleopatra, and a lot of the contemporary accounts come from propaganda that Octavian or Caesar Augustus used to turn Roman opinion against her and Mark Antony as part of his own political moves to gain power. Here she was strongly painted as a seductress with evil lady parts and foreign ways that were the destruction of noble people like Julius Caesar. His anti-Republican moves only happened because of her corruptive qualities. And this depiction of her and the common trope of women as treacherous and destructive has found a lot of currency since then. Virgil, the Roman poet and hype man of Augustus, wrote about Cleopatra in his national epic The Aeneid, painting the emperor's war against her as a clash of civilizations in which Octavian and the Roman gods preserved Italy from conquest by Cleopatra and the barbaric, animal-headed gods of Egypt. Of course, she wasn't the one invading. But still, it's also in this work and his account of the character Dido that actually helped to cast Cleopatra as a soap opera-esque figure that we're really familiar with today. The most detailed history of Cleopatra was written by Plutarch about a century after her death in his work The Lives of Noble Greeks and Romans. Of course, she wasn't one of the noble Greeks or Romans, though, the story that Plutarch wrote about was Mark Antony. And honestly, that'd be like having the most detailed description of Jennifer Lopez's life being in the biography of Mark Antony. And that's not saying that his writings were baseless, absolutely not, but they certainly don't give us the strongest picture of her, especially when we take into consideration that there was already a century-long head start of negative propaganda. By the end of the Roman Empire and into the medieval period, the story of Cleopatra was fairly well known. Really, the, the drama was well known. The world of medieval Europe may have forgotten the imagery of Egypt itself, but the idea of Cleopatra remained intact. Geoffrey Chaucer's 14th century poem, The Legend of Good Women, featured several virtuous women, Cleopatra among them. At the end of her story, Chaucer describes her as being overcome with grief at the death of Antony and casts herself into a pit of snakes to die in fulfillment of her promise to that whatever happened to Antony would also happen to her. Of course, he didn't have a snake death, but whatever. Anyhow, this poem was um, evidently, from its references to a female audience, intended for women. And it was a controversial work at the time. And Dr. Nicola MacDonald has suggested that the poem is supposed to form a body of advice to women on how to navigate society. 
Now, however, it could also be that, you know, that while a man reading the poem or hearing the poem would accept it as all of that, but it was perhaps the intention of Chaucer that the work as understood by a woman should be satire on how men expect women to behave, that one should be literally willing to throw herself into a pit of venomous snakes and die horribly because she made a promise to her man. In contrast to Chaucer's either real or satirical belief in the virtue of her suicide, other authors haven't been so generous. In the fifth canto of the Inferno, part of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, Cleopatra is placed in the second circle of hell, where carnal sinners who subordinate reason to desire can be found, and fierce winds constantly battering their bodies. She's described only as the lustful queen. The Florentine work Concerning Famous Women, published in 1362, mentions Cleopatra as one of the 106 figures and describes her as a greedy, depraved seductress. Since Octavian's propagandas, Cleopatra has often been cast in a role as a dangerous other, not only a, a Jezebel, a femme fatale, but someone foreign and with wiles that could bring good people to their doom. But how to represent that otherness? Keep in mind that people in Europe from the end of the Roman period in, until effectively the 1800s really didn't have a strong image of what ancient Egypt was. Uh, the region was largely cut off from European eyes, so while they would have known what, say, a pharaoh was, thanks in no small part to the Exodus story, but they didn't have a frame of reference on how one might have looked. So they drew stuff like this. And there's a lot of medieval art that does show Cleopatra as a contemporary, light-skinned European. But to stress dangerous foreignness, Cleopatra had to be drawn in a way that People would understand the otherness. And there's a really interesting drawing from southern France from a uh, manuscript called Edgerton 1500, dated to some time after 1323. And while she is dressed as a uh, French queen would have been at the time, Cleopatra's black. This use of blackness to mark Cleopatra as the other, also appears to have been used by William Shakespeare. In Act I of Antony and Cleopatra, the pharaoh is described as being tawny, uh, which in his time and up to more recent times has been used as a way to describe people who are mixed race. And she goes on to say this line, Think on me that am with Phobus's amorous pinches black. Additionally, twice in that play, she is referred to as a gypsy, which is a slur for the Romani people who were originally from South Asia, but mistaken for being Egyptians by Europeans. And these people have and do experience considerable marginalization in Europe. Stereotypes about the Romani paint them as culturally alien, treacherous, promiscuous, greedy, and capable of all sorts of occult mischief. And so this slur found use for Shakespeare to conjure a dastardly foreigner to his audiences. The last pharaoh is widely conceived of as this dramatic femme fatale, albeit tragic or malicious, and her beauty and exoticness have very often taken center stage in her life. But there's a lot more to her than that image. And that was really the point of the docudrama that came out, to show her as this dynamic actor on the political scene of the time. It discussed her as a well-educated and politically savvy person. It wasn't her beauty or powers of seduction that caught the attention of Julius Caesar, but her wit and her diplomatic skills. And these aspects of her two-decade-long reign get overshadowed 
by the telenovela. The docudrama was far more focused on examining her from a feminist perspective than it was through any racial lens. But it was the blackness of Cleopatra that took the focus of outrage, not so much what was actually being said in the docudrama. While taking a backseat to other narratives of her, Cleopatra as a great mind actually has its own long pedigree with several ancient scholars sharing or even adopting her name. A woman who we know as Cleopatra the Physician lived sometime in the first century CE and wrote a book titled Cosmetics. She also produced uh, two works on gynecology, uh, Gynecea and Pisaria. Cosmetics only actually survives in six fragments from later authors who referred to her, namely one of the most famous medical researchers in antiquity, the physician Galen. Then we have Cleopatra the Alchemist, who might have actually been a a group of women who lived sometime around the 3rd century CE. And Cleopatra the Alchemist is credited with several works on alchemy and philosophy, and may have also been the inventor of the distilling tool called an alembic, a work by the mysterious figure known as Metrodora, uh, called On the Diseases and Cures of Women, was actually also misattributed to being written by Cleopatra herself when it was translated from Greek into Roman, possibly because the work actually does make a reference to treatments that were devised by the pharaoh. Whether directly or just out of the coincidence of sharing a name, scholarly women drew on the image of Cleopatra, not as some lusty villain or love-struck beauty, but as somebody who came from a world that allowed women a measure of freedom that they didn't enjoy elsewhere. And that's a message that has been historically sidelined and, in the case of the docudrama, shouted over by outrage against a racialized casting choice. The story of Cleopatra as a woman from a society that allowed women to be empowered enough to hold leadership positions, to learn foreign languages, philosophy, science, and to have the agency to conduct themselves alongside men is really a large reason why efforts were taken to turn her into this foreign temptress. She was absolutely not an image of proper womanhood that would have sat well among Romans, or in medieval Europe, or in much of the modern world. In the 1920s, Ahmed Shaki, one of the Arab world's most influential writers in modern times, wrote the tragedy, The Death of Cleopatra. This work, rather than a melodramatic, romantic, or seductive character, Shaki positions Cleopatra as an anti-colonial hero who stood up against the most powerful empire in the world. And for this nationalist depiction, Egyptians really only needed to trade the invading Romans for the British in their time. And fighting over the race of pharaohs, and especially of Cleopatra, is kind of an absurd exercise. Essentializing her racial characteristics as white, would have been largely meaningless during her own time, and casting her as inherently Greek doesn't do much but to undermine her whole existence as an Egyptian ruler and Egyptian symbol. Ahmed Darter suggested that the majority of the outrage that was leveled against the depiction of Cleopatra in the series had less to do with anti-blackness, although it was still there, than it did with the frustration that Egyptians had for not feeling represented or in control of their own stories. And, I don't know, I I think that might be vastly oversimplifying anti-blackness in Egypt. There is absolutely something worth noting about the idea that Egyptian is African, but not black. But that'll be discussed in the next video.
And while I think he's greatly underplaying the role of anti-blackness and backlashes against wokeism or whatever in all of this, I, I do think that his larger points are pretty solid. The frustration about how Egypt is presented in the West, while certainly understandable, is ultimately pointless. As he put it, when we recognize the common fight of Arabs and Africans against Western imperialism, the contested figure of Cleopatra can be mobilized to stage our common cause, rather than being a stake in a petty competition over who gets screen time in the Empire's streaming service. In the figure of Cleopatra, outrage over racialization only drives wedges between people. It makes divisions that reinforce colonial hierarchies. Being appalled at the perceived blackness of a depiction of Cleopatra is falling into the very trap that centuries of propaganda have set up. And in that othering of Cleopatra, what might have been an inspirational story of ethnic diversity, gender equality, agency, and resistance just becomes a battleground in a culture war that only helps to normalize racial views of the world that fuel systems that keep us unequal. It's doing the Empire's work for them. Thanks so much for watching this video. There is another recent issue with uh, representations of ancient Egypt that I do want to discuss, so I will be taking a deeper look at all of that in my next video. So. If you enjoyed what I've had to rant about so far, don't forget to give us a like. And, you know, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment, and sharing this video and maybe my other videos with people that you know, either your friends or your enemies. You know, whatever. I'm not your boss. Anyhow, I'm Paul Edward, and I'll catch you Archeofiends next time.